Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Tinkering with Tiny Humans. We have my tiny human Jacob here today, and we are going to be building over the next couple days uh, this super mega cyborg hand that came from grandma for Jake's birthday. So this looks pretty exciting, yeah? So the tricky thing about this, I think, is that for some kids, being patient and doing all the detail work that's necessary to build stuff is kind of a challenge. When I was a kid, I would make models and half of the job was breaking the model pieces off of the sprue or the tree, filing down all the little edges, putting the components together, maybe to make a military jet or something like that. But that kind of detail work is challenging for Jake. So he is going to work on uh, doing some detail, attention to detail for this project today. And we'll see how it goes. So I think the best thing to do is to unpack everything. And uh, Jake can take a look at the manual while I'm doing that. And maybe you can find the first steps. Now one thing to pay attention to in here, each of the parts comes on a tree like this. So we have to keep our parts separate. And I think Jake's pretty good at that because he is an expert Lego builder and those parts are divided up by different bag numbers. So if you'd be so kind, Jake, as I'm taking the parts uh, out of the bag, can you figure out what we need to start with? The letter tells us what tree it is, and then the number tells us what part it is. C11 and D7. All right, so you will have to look at these and figure out what components are which. And we're going to be using Oh, here's our bag with our fasteners and springs. All right, we are missing a tool that I need. So you start getting the first couple pieces together and I will show you how to use the tool. I know, but I don't have two of those. So I wanted to help you. So you can start with that. These are, these are called flush cutters. So they're not the same as normal diagonal cutters or dikes. The way that these things are made is when they're assembled and ground, they grind the top surface flat and they put the bevel on the back surface. That way, when we cut a component off of the tree, if we put our flat surface up against the finished part and we make our cut, we get a perfect disconnect without any burr. And if you use diagonal cutters, since they have a bevel on both sides, you end up getting a small burr on the piece that you wanna end up using and you have to end up filing it down. So if at all possible, try to get yourself a pair of flush cutters instead of diagonal cutters. Jake's gonna get started on removing the components and I'm gonna get another pair of those uh, flush cutters. For a project like this, it's not critical that you get all of the burr off when you take a component off. But if you're doing model airplanes or something that you end up finishing with paint, um, you actually have to do a really good job of using fine grit sandpaper to get those little burrs off. And sometimes people use a glazing compound to fill in any of the scratch marks or divots that come from the piece when they're removed from the uh, injection molded part. So these parts are injection molded, which means that they take liquid plastic and they squish it through a mold. And all of these tree components are where the plastic flows. This little spot at the top is called the sprue, and that's where the uh, molten plastic is injected into the metal mold. After it enters here, it goes off into all these other paths um, and fills up the mold. And then once it's cured or once it's cooled, the mold separates and they kick out this completed portion. So that's how these are made in a mold. Do we have any sandpaper? We do have sandpaper. So where's there a bump? There. Well, this one actually might be part of the assembly. So I don't think this needs to come off, but where else? Like here? Okay. Uh, you can either use sandpaper or if you don't have sandpaper, most people have a nail file in their house and that works pretty good too. But I will get you a sanding block if uh, the parts are bugging you. Here's some 220 grit paper. If you want to sand anything, you can just use the back side of this. But make sure we don't take off anything that's a structural component, like those little bumps here. I think these are connections. Everyone's a little bit different, but when I do detailed work like this, time just flies for me. So I'll be in the zone, making sure all the parts are just right, 
and next thing I know, a couple hours has gone by. So Jake's doing a really good job of making sure that those parts are free of burrs and bumps. So that part right there, that looks like that's a lot to sand down. You can always come back again and try it with your cutters again. So the trick is, if you have a flat surface like this, if your cutters are at an angle, it'll remove the piece, but it'll still leave a burr. You want this face to be as parallel as possible to the, the piece that you're keeping. And if we do this, now feel it. I don't even think we have to sand it. Mm. Feel good? Mm -hmm. Another thing you can do is you can hold the cutters at a slight angle, bevel downward from the piece, so that it puts a little bit of a taper onto the cut. So that's a really nice way to do it without requiring sanding. Still got a little bump? Mm -hmm. These ones are a little more precise. No, that's good. But if you want to use mine, you're welcome to them. But these are a little bit larger for your hand. All right, so it's going to go together. We need um, two screws. So here's something to watch out for. There's two different styles of screw in this bag. And this one says actual size. So that way you can hold the screw up onto that picture. And if it fits within the confines of the picture, you know it's the right one. I'm guessing it is not the one with these big heads or an integral washer. It's gonna be the smaller ones. So you'll have to check and double, double check that. I'll get you a screwdriver too. I just cut the corner off of this. So be careful that we don't lose any. Go check and find the right screw and I'll get you a screwdriver. What do you think? Look mm -hmm. good? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what kind of fastener is it? What's the head on the fastener? Phillips. Phillips? Okay. So do you know the difference between this Phillips and this Phillips? Mm, one smaller? Maybe? Yeah, they are. Phillips screwdrivers are sized with numbers. Do you know what number size this is? Mm, no. Do you remember what a small one that we use for the like toys is? Two or one. So you're right, this is a one, this is a zero, and when they get smaller than zero, they become double zero and triple zero. And a number two is bigger than this number one. So a number two is a very popular size, but for smaller things, you'll need a number one or a number zero. So you can pick whatever one you think works best. So what's happening right now that's frustrating you? It won't, it won't, uh, it, won't it just keeps popping out even though I'm holding it straight. So if it keeps popping out even though you're holding it straight, that could mean that you're using too small of a driver. Why don't you try this number one and see how that works. I'll hold the piece for you and you do the turning. What do you think about that? Mm, I guess. And remember, you can always press down on the top while you're spinning it to prevent it from camming out. And for plastic, we can't make it Gorilla tight because you'll strip the threads. So once you feel that it starts to get a little more challenging, then you know that it's tight enough. That's probably good. All right, one more. One more? Good. Mm -hmm. A good rule of thumb with plastic fasteners is once the head of the plastic uh, fastener touches the plastic that you're attaching, turn it maybe an extra quarter of a turn. That should make it tight enough, but it won't strip the plastic. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Check your edges, they're pretty good. Mm -hmm. Nice, all right, what's next step? Mm -hmm. D8 and C8. Okay, here's the D tree. And I'll do C. Another thing you can do, if it's challenging to get the cutters in there, check this out, Jake. See how there's a large portion of tree on each side? You can use your cutters and get the piece off of the tree, even though these little pieces are still attached. And that way you can come back with your cutters and make sure you get the cutter nice and parallel to the edge of the surface, and you'll get a good clean cut that way. <laughs> You might have seen this with Legos before, 
but oftentimes in the instructions, they show you a couple examples of how it's not supposed to be done. And the way they do that is they watch a bunch of people build it and they see what mistakes they make, and then they'll add these extra illustrations. So if it looks like that, it's bad. If it looks like that, it's bad. If it looks like that, it's bad. So you wanna make sure that the orientation of the two pieces matches that picture. So we're gonna pause our video and we're gonna build a couple more sections and when we have some sub-assemblies done, we'll show you the progress that we made. All right, so we built this sub-assembly, so that's pretty cool. And there were some interesting parts that we struggled with. So we had some difficulty with the fasteners and we decided that the best trick was to tighten it until it just touched and then turn it an extra quarter turn and that'll make it snug without actually stripping the fasteners. And our next challenging task is to put these little foam grippy pieces on. And sometimes you have to get the adhesive into little nooks and crannies and it's challenging to do. So anytime you're applying a decal or foam like this, a good trick is to take the piece off and stick it on the edge of a screwdriver or a razor blade. So you can attach it onto the corner of a razor blade or a screwdriver, and that will help you manipulate the piece into any tricky areas and get it centered before you actually attach it. Because some of these adhesives are very strong and once they touch down, it's very challenging to move them again. So Jake is gonna start putting on the correct pieces of adhesive and foam where they belong using this little screwdriver. Hey. Use your special screwdriver. If you touch it with your fingers a lot, another bad thing that'll happen is you'll get the adhesive um, to not be tacky anymore. So that's why it's also helpful to put it on a screwdriver so you don't ruin the adhesive on it. If you can't get that back in, all you have to do is take away the waste material because we're not gonna be using this. And then you can have more room to move stuff around. So how are you selecting the right size piece of foam? The very key. Ah, excellent. So what does the answer key tell you? Um, what number of what foam is? Cool. Hey, watch. Stop for this one. I want to show you. This is an example of a tricky one because you have to get it right between those two lines. If you put the foam centered on your tool, you can go like this and line it up to the left, line it up to the right, and when it's exactly where you want, you just start touching it. And then you take away your tool, that's perfect. While you're working on that, I will trim out B7 and D4 for you. Another thing I didn't show you, Jake, is the way that you hold your pliers makes it easier to operate sometimes. So if you hold your pliers like this in your hand, that's okay if you're trying to crush down on something that's really hard to cut through, like steel instead of plastic. But if you're using cutters on plastic, what's helpful is to hold it like this. You hold the cutter in one hand with your ring finger, and then you use your other two fingers to manipulate the cutters. That way you can open and close it with the other hand. Now this one's got a, a spring in it, so that helps a little bit, but if you have a tool that doesn't have a spring, if you hold it like this in your hands, you can manipulate the tool in both directions, opening and closing it. And if you cut down on something that's really tricky, you can change your hand position. Once you've got it in position, bring your hand around and then you can crush down on it if it's really tricky to cut. So that's just a good way to hold it. You can also hold the cutters upside down that way as well. So if I need to get in some tricky spots, I can put this in the palm of my hand and manipulate this with my other fingers to get into tight spots and cut away the piece. Sound good? Cool. All right, here's this for you. What other piece do you need? Mm. B7 
Okay. So check this out. Sometimes if our hands aren't strong enough to put something together, we can use the table as support. Oh, wrong joint. Okay. B5. B5, yes, I'll get you B5. There you go. So it says times three, that means we need to make three duplicates of that. So I will cut out um, two more of each of those for you. Do you want to do, here you can do these, do that one and that one. Uh, yeah, those are just holders in, in between. Yep, those get cut off too. You know, if we succeed in getting this one done, I think the next more challenging one would be Grandpa got you a model of an internal combustion engine inside of a car. That would be really cool. So if we accomplish this, that would be the next challenge. I think that's flat enough. I don't think there's another piece that's going to be bumping right up against it. There'll be space in between them, so that's good. So... Assuming you did this one correct, you can use this as a template, and this will be a pattern for you to make the other ones. All right, it looks like you can connect them to the hand frame and then we can take a pause for the day. There you go, perfect. So here, check this out. We can cantilever this over the edge and that way it'll give us support to press down and still give us clearance to connect stuff. Excellent. Fantastic. So look at this progress we made. We've got this subassembly done. We have these joints connected. I think we did some great work today. So we're going to take a break and uh, go visit with some friends and then we'll pick off or continue our progress tomorrow. Sound good, buddy? Okay, so we need, to see, so we need C7 and uh, two of the same screws that we were using before. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's the screws. And what color is C? Uh, the gray? Like dark gray? Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure it's the black one. Okay. So, C7. C C yeah, C7. One second, let me find it. Let's see. It's also easy to look at. Oh, here. yeah, that's a good idea. Ooh, we also need A4 and A5. Okay, you do A4 and 5, and I will do C7. These ones might need to be cut extra, might need to be sanded or okay. just extra well cut because uh, I'm pretty sure that these are supposed to fit into somewhere. I mean, they do. I don't believe that these are for anything. They're just for decoration, like okay. those other things. Okay. Like these spiral things that we can do.
The other way you can figure it out is you can hold the piece back up onto here and see which one matches up. Yes, but they look exactly the same. Well, maybe, like, maybe they are not. Like the both of these are A6. I know what we can do. I oh, can wait, bring a sharpie a over and we can mark the number on the back of the piece so no one will see it, but we'll know. Dad, figured out which one it was. Okay. One, okay, so one has small holes at the bottom and one has big ones. Ah, excellent. You needed A10. Okay, wait. And what else? Wait, there was... Shit. A16? C7. C7. And the screws. But we haven't screwed the screws in yet. Don't you need these? Yeah, but we're in, but we're in an old map. Oh, okay. yeah. So this is the time where your screwdriver should be a little bit crooked because the piece is not parallel to the table. So you're going to want to hold okay. the screwdriver a little bit at an angle. Um, okay. See, that's why I don't like doing that. Why? Oh, because it just does that. It just falls. So remember on a piece like this, how we can test to see if it's tight enough is there shouldn't be any movement between these two pieces. And now I can't move any wiggle, so that means it's tight enough. That's good. All right, and then I think these caps go on. Okay. I wrote down what number they are on the back in case it matters. It doesn't, I mean, I'm pretty sure we could find it. Yes, I think they're the same. Yeah, the same thing. If they came from the same number. One 16 and one is 10. The back of a screwdriver can be like a soft hammer. So sometimes you can use this and go, and now it's flat. Okay, so we need D15, A3, and C5. Okay. Give you the next pieces, I think. Wait, so is it is this supposed to be a get a little gap in there? Cause I can't tell. Wait. So I'm guessing that gap should not be there because the screw is supposed to go in. So we need to figure out why that is. Oh, just need to be pressed in. Uh, you can put the screw. In. This you have to be careful with. The attachment is just that little bump. If you cut off this whole peg, that's going to get in the way of our piece working. So just be careful when you see a little attachment point next to a big attachment point. Because you do not want to cut that off. That would be very bad. We are doing some good teamwork. What? 
where I have uh, two places to put the thumb. That is true. Maybe you can set it up left-handed or right-handed. Mm, I think you just rearrange it. Alright, so this guy needs to snap on and then I'll give you some other pieces for the next page. I think it's supposed to flop around like that. Yeah, until it's attached to something, I think you're right. But these can come together so there's no yeah, that's space. Good. That's good. Yeah, Ooh. it's making sure, actually, it wants you to verify that this piece goes through here somehow. So this Ooh, cannot be I correct. See. I think I see. Or have we okay. not put those on yet? We, yeah, we haven't put them on. Oh, yet. then you're good. It's when we attach these pieces, it's supposed to be trapped in there. Okay. So here's this and this. Oh look, it shows that this pin has to go through that center hole up there. And this pin has to go through the hole in the body. All right, Jake, what's next? Okay. So, we are doing the uh, hydraulic assembly. Did we finish the thumb? Uh, I don't believe that we ever did the thumb yet. Maybe right. that happens later. Yeah. Let's, see. Let's double check. Yeah, because I don't believe that this uses the, uses the, that the thumb uses the hydraulic fluid. Oh, yeah, you're right. Thumb's later. Okay. Okay, so we need G1 and G3. Wait, and the tube has to be cut to... Wait. Okay, wait, wait, we need three G3 and one G1. Apparently... Yeah, just get them all out. Because, uh... Yeah, we need three G1s, one G2. Well, I'll just cut them all out because they're labeled on the device. We need to cut it exactly at... Okay, so we need three cut at exactly 12 centimeters times three. And one cut at 34 centimeters. Okay. And we have to straight and we have to straighten it out okay. before we do this. Okay, and the the remaining tube after we cut out three sets of after we cut out three sets of uh twelve, there should be approximately 34 centimeters remaining. remaining. Okay. 12 centimeters, 12 centimeters. All right, I'm going to get a ruler for you. Since we don't have... What? Since we don't have a metric ruler, we're going to have to do it in English units. So where did that ruler go? So four and three quarters of an inch is what we want. How many of those? Uh, three. Okay. Of them. And we and we don't need to actually trim anything for the three quarters. Wait. Wait, it says that we need these. What? So three at twelve centimeters? Uh yes, three are at twelve centimeters. And don't make uh, I don't mean like make three marks at twelve centimeters. <laughs> See three 
P9, which is already... P9 is the oil for hydraulic fluid. Oh, we also need B6. So I'll get B6. Okay. Where, wait, we don't have the oh, other color. Where's the second color? Um, it was over here, right there. Yeah, so it's just enough to coat it, I think. So do we need to, co to coat all of them? Okay. Um, well, it's going to have you use some like rubber gaskets, too. Okay. I think they want you to use this little thing to wipe off the excess. Okay. Okay. Do we need to do this? It says anywhere that there is the symbol. All right, we are going to pause the video and then we'll get back once we have all of the hydraulic stuff um, put together and lubricated. Okay? Got it. Okay, so now we need B3, C12, F14. And D18. Well, why don't we talk about what we accomplished? Okay. So we put together all of our hydraulic system and the hydraulic system will use fluid to convey a force from one place to another. So when we squeeze this piston, it forces the fluid out of the cylinder and into this tube and then it fills in the other reservoir and piston. So I can move this actuator remotely by using a fluid. And we worked pretty hard to get most of the water out because hydraulic systems depend on water or oil being substantially incompressible, which means that they can't be squished. And if you have a lot of uh, air in the system, it can make the system spongy or not as powerful. So we worked pretty hard to purge all the air out. So we have each of our actuators uh, and control systems together. And now we're gonna assemble the rest of the hand that will be used to control these features. Basically a thumb. Yeah, this one's the thumb controller, I think. All right, so we'll put these out of the way. What are the next plastic pieces we need? Okay, so we need B3, D18, C12, and F14. I'll start on B3. Black is Does it need the washer head screw or the smaller screw? Mm, I think it's the, the smallest 
Did you skip this? No, that comes next. One, these are, this is all stuff. This on. is two. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know which one's which, you'll have to figure it out. That, that's probably it. Need to apply some foam next. Mm -hmm. An F2. hook up the hydraulic cylinder and then we'll pause the video and we'll do another subsection. Yeah. Does it work yet? Stop. Okay, sorry. You should always try your subassemblies as you're building. And then I think it asks you to keep a little bit of loop there to aid in motion. Because if we make it super tight, look, it'll kink. So we got to keep a minimum bend radius. That looks about right. All right. Once you have that clipped in, why don't you try it? Sure. Oh, that is super cool. That is so neat. All right, let's build our next subsection. No, sorry, F17 and F20. Well, maybe that's why this thing adjusts forward and backward. No, it's just like me. Well then I think these also, look, I think you forgot to put this on and that's what tightens the grip between your hand. So that goes on that side. So these things adjust with a worm screw, which is kind of how an adjustable end wrench or a crescent wrench is adjusted. So you spin this worm drive and it takes up the space around your yes, hand. Yes, but it won't fit in. Well, note that it's keyed. Look, there's a D-shape to it. Here, let's show the camera. So there's a D-shape to it, so it has to go in only one orientation. I've done, we're not done yet. Right. I think the next step is to attach the thumb. All right, next step, thumb attaching. All right, let's attach that thumb. Do 
Does it say you can put the thumb on either the left yes, side or the right yes, side? Yes, it does. It does say that. So check this out. See how this is springy? Yes. That always means that the other side, the rigid side, goes in first. So you're going to click the rigid side in first, and then compress the springy part, and then it'll snap in. Good? And then where does this get mounted? Oh, wait, we need F9. Okay. It depends if you want to be left-handed or right-handed, where it goes. Wait, it has to be on the left side if I want it to be right-handed, because how would I pull it from here? I don't know. Oh, my gosh. That was wrong. Other side. Oh my gosh, I did it on the wrong hand. Wait, did I? Yes, How does it tell you to select yeah. the correct side? Wait. Mm. Wait, but my... Wait, no wait, it should always be on this side because my pinky and other those fingers there. Wait, no, I don't. Okay. So you're building the... There we go. Look, you're building the left-handed configuration because it says the right-handed configuration is on 32. So... So let's do some practicing and then we can do some video of manipulating different stuff and picking stuff up with it. All right, Jakey, we are all done. We've got all of our hydraulic lines connected and our actuators connected. Why don't you show all the different stuff we can do? We can move the thumb, finger, other finger. Final finger by moving the two fingers. You can also uh, readjust where the fingers go. Like if you put them both out here, it just makes it look weird. If you put them both in here, it just makes also makes it, it just makes it look like a this. Or put them both out. If you put them both on the center, it's just like that. Also, uh, we adjust this by taking by taking these parts both of these parts are like this and then moving it backward and forward has left. Um, what does this do? This readjusts. Oh, like the total open or closed of the hand? So you could grab like huge boxes if you open it like that, right? Mm-hmm. Any other features that you're a fan of? So hydraulics are really cool because you can multiply power with them. So when we lift up a car with a jack, um, that's a hydraulic cylinder that's lifting an entire car. Even though you're only pushing down on the lever by a couple pounds, you're able to lift a couple tons worth of car, which is really cool. And that's how these hydraulic lines work. It's really neat. Anything else you want to share? No. All right. Well, thanks for joining us again on Tinkering with Tiny Humans. We'll uh, hopefully have more projects to do with you. And maybe there'll be projects you would enjoy doing with your family. And until then, have a great day. And thanks for joining us. Bye.